Good evening, everyone. My name is David Maldow, and I'm a second year radiology resident at the University of Rochester and current chair of the SIR RFS Clinical Education Committee. On behalf of the entire resident fellow student section, I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight for a very special collaborative webinar featuring Dr. Stephen Schmidt of Podiatry and Dr. Georgie Vatican-Cherry of Interventional Radiology. This past March at the SIR annual meeting in Washington, D.C., the American Pediatric Medical Association gave an inspiring talk led by President Dr. Daniel Davis. He recognized that podiatrists and IR physicians can learn more from each other about our unique roles in the management of PAD. This can enhance our ability to work effectively together as providers and ultimately improve care for our patients. Tonight's joint webinar is the first of what we hope will be many collaborative efforts aimed at enhancing our knowledge of PAD from two unique perspectives. Before we begin, a quick note on audience participation during the webinar. Please type your questions into the question box at any time, and we will field them at the end of the presentation. Let's get right to it and introduce our presenters for the evening. Dr. Vatican Cherry is an IR physician and professor at Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles, one of the founding fathers of the SIR RFS. He's been a tremendous advisor and mentor for all of us in the RFS and places a strong emphasis on developing the clinical skills and knowledge necessary to manage our patients in totality. We're thrilled to have Dr. V here tonight to speak about the management of patients with PAD from the IR perspective. But first, I will now turn it over to Dr. Diane Tower, who is the Director of Clinical Affairs for the APMA. Diane has played a critical role in starting this initiative, which I very much appreciate, and we will be introducing, she will be introducing our first presenter this evening, Dr. Stephen Schmidt of Podiatry. Diane, the floor is yours. David, thank you for the introduction and good evening, everyone. As David mentioned, my name is Diane Tower and I'm a podiatrist and director of clinical affairs for the APMA. The APMA and its young physician program are very excited to join with SIR in this collaborative effort to educate and grow so we may take exceptional care of our patients together. The APMA Young Physician Program is, to is designed to support the needs of our organization's members who are in residency, fellowship, and early in their practicing career. We strive to provide information that can help create strong interdisciplinary teams and are appreciative of our representative this evening, Dr. Stephen Schmid. Dr. Schmid practices in Minnesota, currently serves as the president of the Minnesota Board of Podiatric Medicine and is the Young Physician Liaison to the APMA Board of Trustees. Dr. Schmid. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about interventional radiology and podiatry, or as we like to refer to it as toes and flows. Um, as Diane already introduced you, my name is Steve Schmid, um, and I'm a podiatrist practicing in Minnesota. <coughs> Let's see if I can start this. So let's first start out talking about podiatry and peripheral arterial disease. Um, I like to think of podiatrists as kind of the, the first responders of PAD. Uh, like the gentleman on the right who's in the lookout tower looking for that fire, we're, we're down kind of in the danger zone looking for signs of PAD, uh, which many of you know uh, often manifest themselves in the foot first. Um, so like I said, podiatrists are often the first ones to identify signs and symptoms of PAD. Uh, and because of this, we're also often directing the flow of treatment, pun intended. Um, while many of the signs and symptoms manifest in lower extremities, it really does take a team approach to address them. So I always think of us as a team player. We're not really the one directing all the flow. We're not doing all the treatment. Uh, I don't think any one specialty uh, can uh, fully treat PAD in its entirety on their own, and it does require a team approach. So we can't talk about PAD without talking about the morbidity and mortality of PAD. Um, as many of you know, it's very prevalent in society, affecting about 8 to 10 million Americans. Um, there's about, uh, patients with PAD, there's about a three to six time increased risk of cardiovascular morbidity and death. Um, this should tell you that PAD and coronary artery disease are also intricately related. Um, in fact, the patients with coronary artery disease, uh, PAD was found to be a stronger risk factor uh, for cardiac and cerebrovascular disease, death, and total mortality than a prior MI. 50% um, mortality rate at five years, 70% at 10 years for critical in ischemia. 
uh, very high um, disorder, clear critical in ischemia is really any patient with a chronic ischemic rest pain, uh, ulcers, or gangrene attributed to objectively proven arterial occlusive disease. Um, the mortality rate at five years for critical ischemia is higher than breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. Um, in critical ischemia, at one year, 50% of your patients will have no amputation, 25% will have a major amputation, and 25% will have died. So let that sink in for just a moment. In one year, once you're diagnosed with critical ischemia, a quarter of them will have died, a quarter of them will have had a major amputation. To me, that says that despite all of our advances, we still have a long ways to go. Again, I don't think you can talk about uh, PAD without talking about amputation. 54% uh, of uh, cases with limb loss are, are due to dysvascular disease. It's the highest um, uh, category of reasons for limb loss. Um, and over two-thirds of amputations due to dysvascular disease have a comorbid diagnosis of diabetes. Um, nearly 50% of amputees due to vascular disease will die within five years. Uh, again, very high mortality rate, higher than breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. Um, and certainly, we, we have to talk about the cost of amputations, um, extremely high cost. Uh, in fact, the median cost of managing a patient after amputation is estimated to be almost twice that of a successful limb salvage. So I think even if uh, there's any any question, I think it's, it's worth uh, giving that uh, um, that patient a shot, uh, trying to save that limb. Uh, we have a, a saying um, in our profession, save a limb, save a life. Um, so really important. <clears throat> so what are our goals of PAD management? Um, we want to relieve ischemic pain, uh, heal ischemic ulcers, prevent limb loss, um, or major amputation, uh, improve patient function, improve the quality of life, um, and prolong survival. Um, it's, I, I put the picture off to the right because it kind of reminds me of what PAD is. You have great flow and then you have some sort of blockage and, and, and then narrowing there, and that's the, the Hoover Dam. So uh, what's involved with the initial workup and treatment? Um, the slide here looks pretty basic. I have comprehensive history of physical illness. Um, very important, uh, understanding the patient's uh, complaints, when are they having pain, how are they having pain, or, or what are their other symptoms, and that's going to help drive you into to making this diagnosis. Um, and certainly a, uh, a family history is really important, uh, looking for a family history of peripheral arterial disease, coronary artery disease, or diabetes. Um, oftentimes, if they have a strong family history, um, they themselves will have uh, uh, PAD to an extent. Um, in terms of past medical history, also looking for factors like hypertension, high cholesterol, and advanced age uh, has a strong uh, correlation with PAD. Uh, of course, social history, looking at tobacco use, um, and the physical exam, which we'll get to in just a moment. On the right, I have a classification system, the Fontaine, the Rutherford. Um, it's kind of set up uh, in a similar fashion where you have asymptomatic, or asymptomatic patients uh, mild claudication all the way through severe claudication, ischemic rest pain, ulceration, and gangrene. So if you have a patient that comes in with an ischemic ulcer, they are automatically uh, a Fontaine 4 and Rutherford 4 um, without even uh, any other uh, issues going on. Um, so, you know, a lot of times in podiatry, that's kind of the first presentation we might see a uh, patient who has a wound that hasn't healed or, or has a complaint of gangrene. And those are automatically in the category of critical and ischemia and need to be addressed immediately. Um, but I do want to warn you that uh, peripheral arterial disease is variable and it's unpredictable and can often circumvent the traditional understanding of the progression from peripheral arterial disease all the way to critical and ischemia. Um, also to note, if you have a patient who's diabetic, um, oftentimes they do have peripheral neuropathy um, these patients often at times are not very healthy. Um, so they may not have that pain associated with claudication and may progress from an asymptomatic state to critical, critical limb ischemia without any noticeable progression in between. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of PAD? Well, some of our subjective signs, they may come in complaining of cold feet, uh, just generalized pain, uh, calf pain or remnant claudication like the gentleman off to the right, um, pain at rest, uh, pain when they elevated. In fact, a lot of times you come in and see them in the hospital um, and they're laying in their hospital bed and they have that one leg hanging down. Uh, that's often an indication that uh, they may have PAD. 
Uh, they can have numbness, they can have edema. Color changes like you see on the picture on the right, obvious, uh, sometimes kind of a, a rubor sort of appearance. Um, and oftentimes we see them in podiatry because they come in complaining of a wound that, that they've had for a couple months, it just won't heal. Um, or they've, they've been uh, treated elsewhere and the wounds haven't healed, uh, but they haven't had any other significant workup. <clears throat> what are some of the objective signs? Uh, well, certainly a weak or an absent pulse. Um, absence of hair, although it's not uh, always a strong indicator. Um, sometimes cool or cold skin. Um, sometimes you can even feel um, a pretty strong line of thermal demarcation. Uh, approximately they have uh, kind of warm, normal feeling skin and then uh, as, you're, as you're bringing your hand down, all of a sudden it turns to a cool or cold uh, type of skin. Um, skin that's uh, kind of thin, shiny, or atrophic, dry skin. Um, they may have a sluggish cap or refill time or in no cap refill time. Uh, dependence ruber. Um, sometimes they can have edema. Again, I said non-healing wound. And dry gangrene, like the picture on the right. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of uh, further in initial workup, um, obviously ABIs are kind of a staple for assessing for PAD. Um, an ABI less than 0.6 generally indicates inadequate perfusion to heal a wound on the foot. Um, PBIs actually can be more accurate in quantifying PAD in diabetic patients who may not may have non-compressible vessels. And then PCPO2 looking for tissue perfusion. Um, certainly lifestyle modifications are important, uh, getting them to stop smoking. I'm always surprised that the patient who's a two-pack-a-day smoker who comes in in critical limb ischemia and wants you to save their leg but is not uh, willing to, to even cut back on smoking. They'd rather die than, than quit. Um, physical activity is really important um, as well as healthy heart eating. Uh, I know my hospital recently partnered with the University of Minnesota to have a program to increase awareness of PAD um, and get those with findings of PAD on ABIs into a supervised exercise program through our cardiac rehab. Um, <clears throat> There's certainly medical management, which I'm going to um, have Dr. Vatican Churi uh, discuss in a little bit here. Um, and wound care, initial wound care usually for PAD, especially if you're, if you're worried about critical ischemia, uh, usually centers around um, uh, managing bile burden, uh, trying to decrease bile burden, um, and then moisture balance. But usually I try to keep these wounds a little bit dry. I think it's better wet than dry in this case. Um, but uh, being careful to have limited or no debridement uh, in the absence of infection. Um, these patients aren't going to heal very well and you don't want to create a larger wound. Um, and then uh, further vascular workup might include MRA, CTA, angiography. Um, there are some other promising studies including fluorescence, fluorescence angiography that are out there. Um, and I put on the, on the right uh, just kind of a flow sheet of uh, if you suspect, suspect critical in ischemia. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, I would do the ABI order plus the vascular specialist consult at the same time. I don't wait for the vascular specialist to order it. Um, my interventional radiologist wants to see that ABI before they see the patient. Um, and it is kind of interesting to note that, you know, rigid guidelines for management of patients with critical ischemia aren't always appropriate, just kind of due to the complexities that are involved optimally treating the patient. So oftentimes they have other factors that may need to be addressed at the same time. Um, you can't just stick to a rigid uh, flow sheet um, all the time. <clears throat> And I don't think we can have a discussion about PAD without also mentioning angiosomes. Um, angiosomes are important to know. Um, you know, hopefully our um, interventional radiologist colleagues kind of know these like the back of their hand. But even for us podiatrists, it's important to know what artery feeds what part of the leg or the foot. Um, I, especially if you have a, a non-healing wound, you uh, send them off for a vascular intervention. You want to make sure that uh, that uh, interventionalist uh, where the wound is at kind of what, what artery you suspect is uh, um, not getting any flow through it, and, and that's the one that they may want to concentrate on if they have to pick and choose. Um, so if you have a wound, you know, on the, the medial uh, ankle, you know, posterior tibial artery is, is likely the, uh, the offending artery there. So I said, like I said earlier, um, nobody can really manage PAD and critical limb ischemia effectively without going through a team management approach. It really does take a team to adequately address this. Um, up on top, I included the patient as part of the team, and that's, that's because they are. By getting that patient involved with their care, increase the risk of losing that patient to follow-up. 
And in fact, I always encourage the patient to bring a spouse, a family member, or a care provider to their appointments uh, just so they have another advocate in the room, somebody to help them remember what was said during their appointment, somebody to hold them accountable after they leave that appointment. Um, I think you, you talk, start talking to patients about they have no blood flow, possibility of an amputation, uh, and I think they just kind of shut off, and it's, it's good to have somebody else there to help um, hold them accountable for that. Um, so uh, family involvement is, is obviously very important. Um, up at the top there, I have both podiatry and our revascularization specialists, whether it's interventional radiology, vascular surgery, whatever you have available to you. Um, and then certainly other specialties are in the mix, uh, infectious disease, if there are signs of infection. Uh, you may have general surgery, orthopedics, or vascular surgery on board if uh, possible, major amputation is indicated. Primary care physician to help with some of the medical management and also drive some of the referrals. Um, but that circle can really expand pretty quickly to include a number of us, including cardiology, given the strong association with coronary artery disease, plastics for possible complicated closures, social work, orthotist, prosthetist, nutritionalist, endocrinologist, and, and a number of other ancillary staff. But uh, here we're talking about our relationship here between podiatry and, and uh, interventional radiology. Um, so how I kind of like to think about this, I kind of think of podiatrists as that surveillance drone in the sky, um, always on the lookout for patients with PAD, um, and our interventional radiologist is that drone operator. Uh, some of this might look familiar to you, a little bit of a dark room, a lot of big fancy looking screens. Um, this gentleman has a bunch of food on the counter. I think that actually might be my interventional radiologist right there. All that's missing is a, a big cup of coffee. But uh, these are these are the guys who are going in and they're, they're blowing away the clogs in the arteries and they're opening up things so that uh, that we can continue to treat this patient. Um, I also often re fondly refer to them as my Mario and my Luigi. And I think it's easy to tell patients, um, you know, that they're essentially the plumbers, that they're there to open up the pipes and get that flow going. And um, all patients understand that analogy. All right, so we, we've talked a little bit about um, treatment, uh, or I'm sorry, the assessment, uh, a little bit of early treatment in the office. Um, but really, next we're going to go into a little bit more of the, the advanced treatment. So, um, you know, what makes a good candidate for medical therapy versus revascularization versus amputation? Um, really, uh, for medical therapy alone, if it's uh, uncomplicated, uh, very low tissue loss, Maybe they're a poor surgical candidate. Uh, if you're looking at revascular, revascularizing those that don't, don't fall in the um, amputation only or the medical therapy, therapy only category, those that are ambulatory, I'm sorry, ambulatory uh, preoperatively or living independent preoperatively uh, often are, are good candidates for revascularization. And then certainly there's the amputation category. Um, there's a study by Taylor et al. who evaluated the, the functional outcomes at five years for surgical revascularization. Uh, they found that the location or type of reconstruction as well as the comorbidities did not predict functional outcomes. Instead, impaired ambulatory ability at the time of presentation and the presence of dementia were significant determinants of poor functional outcomes. So those that aren't ambulating independently, uh, those that uh, are not independent living, um, maybe a, a poor um, candidate for revascularization, maybe better um, suited with a uh, partial or full limb amputation. Um, certainly those with spreading infection in the presence of PAD likely will uh, fall in that amputation category, um, and like I mentioned, those with dementia, um, and limited, limited life expectancy. Um, certainly, again, you know, you can't use this as a rigid structure. Sometimes there are exceptions. The gentleman off on the left, uh, I saw he had a toe amputation by another physician um, for osteomyelitis. Um, according to him, the dressing was on too tight. He ended up with a, a number of different wounds on the foot. Um, the wound up top is actually uh, below the first MPJ. You can see that that hallux is uh, severely the dorsal blocking um, on that MPJ. And what you can actually see is um, the first metatarsal had poken out through there and it's necrotic. Osteomyelitis, the first metatarsal, um, he was adamant about keeping his foot. And to him, that was extremely important. Um, the foot had developed a little bit of a varus contracture. To me, it was not a very functional limb. He's a poor candidate for a major reconstructive type of surgery to, to fix the, the deformity of the foot. 
Um, he knew he wouldn't be walking on it, but it, it was a stigma of losing his leg. He was okay with losing the big toe and part of the foot, but he wanted to keep his leg. So he gave it a try. He went through a revascularization process and a partial first ring amputation. That was bottom picture was at his first follow-up appointment. He's since gone on to heal very well. So when we talk about amputation, um, we have a number of different considerations. Um, we want to look at flat viability. Um, we need adequate blood flow to heal. Um, ABI of greater than 0.5, uh, typically in patients with diabetes, 0.45 without diabetes diabetes or TCPO2 measuring um, 20 to 30 millimeters mercury uh, generally is a good indication of viability of the skin. Uh, certainly if there's uh, necrosis, you want to make sure um, you resect proximal of that. Um, and, you know, for example, if you're doing a transmetatarsal amputation, you need to have good enough skin plantarly in order to close that. So if they have uh, necrotic skin plantarly, uh, they may, that may change your amputation level. Um, that also goes with co uh, coverage for closure. You want to make sure you have enough coverage for closure. Um, these are these are wounds and healing to begin with. You want to make sure you get uh, nice, healthy skin uh, closing over um, the, uh, the the amputation site. Um, and then certainly infection. Um, you need to uh, remove infection from the equation, whether it's uh, you know through amputating uh, through infected uh, bone or uh, IV antibiotics. Um, and then you have to look at the foot. Uh, whether it's going to be a functional amputation. I had a gentleman who um, had critical ischemia, had a number of different wounds, was treated in another facility, uh, came to me and he had a partial first ray, uh, fourth ray, and fifth ray amputation. So the gentleman basically had his second and third toe that he was ambulating on. He was extremely unstable. It wasn't a very functional amputation type. Um, so he needed to be converted to, to a, a less rank amputation. Um, and then certainly you want to consider your, your tendon balancing. Um, if you're doing a Lisfranc or short parts amputation, you want to balance tendons out. If you're detaching that tibia off anterior, that uh, peroneus longus tendon. Um, and then certainly consider a, um, uh, an Achilles tendon lengthening uh, to prevent Aquinas contractures, um, which may lead to further ulcerations. And then you want to consider whether it needs a minor or major amputation if you can try to stay part of that foot. Um, there are a number of studies that show that uh, functional um, exertion with a partial foot amputation is less than a belonging amputation. Um, so from a functional exertional level, that might be uh, desirable, um, but if, if you look at a signs amputation, I think you're probably better off with a belonging amputation with prosthesis. So I'm going to go into a couple cases. Um, this is a, a young 88-year-old female came in to see me. She, her complaint was a, a wound that just wouldn't heal, and, and this is what I saw on my first visit there. Uh, she had a left second toe ulcer that went uh, down the bone. You're actually looking into the proximal interfalon gel joint there. Um, she had a, a past medical history of coronary artery disease, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, had a cabbage. Um, former smoker. Um, you know, on exam, she had absent fetal pulses, exposed bone, a little bit of redness, swelling in that toe. Um, so obviously, my my consult to interventional radiology went out. Um, we ended up uh, ordering some ABIs on her. Um, ABIs uh, showed 0.54 with monophasic signals on the left and 0.31 with monophasic signals on the right. Uh, she underwent an angiogram and arthrectomy of the left common femoral artery, proximal left SFA, uh, angioplasty of uh, interstent stenosis on the mid-left SFA as well. Um, did some wound care and debridement, um, debrided down the exposed bone, um, put her on uh, IV antibiotics to, to get rid of that bone infection after we got the culture results back. Um, and following that injury, and by the way, she did have a lot of Doppler of the, the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial arteries. And so she came back in and uh, she healed that wound very nicely. And you can also look at just the quality of the skin um, from the toe on the top picture, the one on the bottom, um, just much healthier looking skin there. So this is another case that kind of fell into my lap. This is a 78 year old uh, female who's just kind of a spitfire of a patient. Uh, she's Native American and I only put that in there because she, um, she had some pretty um, deep seated cultural beliefs um, she actually came in um, with uh, her family. She was previously seen somewhere else. Um, she had a, a third toe amputated for ischemia and osteomyelitis. Later was converted into a TMA, uh, obviously had non-healing of the PMA site. Um, and she developed a subsequent infection, non-healing wounds. 
Um, and there was a recommendation for belonging amputation by multiple surgeons, which she refused. She had wanted to keep that leg. Uh, her ambulation status was pretty limited. Um, but I had the, the family there to um, discuss things with her, her daughter and her granddaughter, who um, I think were a little bit more progressive than she was. But having that family member there was, it was critical because they were able to kind of bridge the gap between me and her and help her come to an understanding and, and understand why um, I'm choosing the, the care that I am. Um, but she had a, a past medical history, CVA with hemiplegia. Um, she's, un she's kind of an uncontrolled diabetic. I said she had MRSA, osteomyelitis, the toe, um, and she's also a former smoker. Um, so I sent her off to get an angiogram. I'm sorry, actually she had an angiogram before she saw me. Uh, she saw my interventional radiologist, did an angiogram, uh, noted a complete occlusion of the SFA, which was revascularized, and he immediately sent her over to me. Um, I find I almost get as many referrals to me from him as I do from, uh, I'm sorry, referrals from him to me than I, I do from me to him. Um, but anyway, shortly after the uh, angiogram, I saw her in my office for the first time. The picture on the right is what I saw, um, which doesn't look too pretty, um, actually below. Um, and uh, so I took her to the operating room for debridement of that wound, application of a wound vac, because she was pretty sensate. It couldn't really do much. Um, and that's the uh, first follow-up appointment on the right. Um, during the uh, procedure, I noted that she had some soft cuneiforms that were exposed centrally. Um, I debrided this down to the bone biopsy. Bone biopsy came off or came back as MRSA, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, enterobacter and pterococcus. So um, she had a lot of antibiotic resistance. I ended up sending her over to infectious disease for consultation. Um, infectious disease uh, uh, put her on a six week course of oral, augmentin, and Bactrim. So um, she went, underwent six weeks of oral antibiotics, uh, repeated wound back uh, uh, changes, and regular debridement in the office. Uh, she refused a skin graft over the wound, so we had uh, treated it with local wound care, wound back. Um, and uh, she uh, came back recently, and this is what she looks like now. Um, so she's closed this wound. She's doing really well on that side. Uh, she's very happy with uh, saving the leg, especially since there were multiple recommendations for a baloney amputation. Um, but of course, the disappointment, she also comes in and says, hey, doc, my, my left foot is hurting too. Um, there's a nurse at the nursing home, and she picked off my ingrown toenail without a glove on, which I don't know if I believe. Um, but uh, so I said, well, let's take off your, your, you know, your sock on your left foot and take a look. And this is what I see. And I'm saying, oh, no, here we go again. Um, obviously, um, there's there's ischemia going there, some dry gangrenous changes, uh, possibly an infection. And if you pan out, uh, this is actually what the rest of the leg looked like. So not only do you have an ischemic hallux, but you also have um, an ischemic wound um, on the anterior shin. Um, so uh, once I saw that, um, she went, uh, she got an, an, an ABI immediately. Um, which showed uh, an ABI of 0.44 on the left, monophasic signals um, of the dorsalis and posterior tibial arteries. Um, the right side was 1.08 with monophasic signals. So immediately sent her back to her interventional radiologist. She underwent an angiogram. Um, it was noted to have a left common iliac occlusion. Uh, the revascularization was unsuccessful. Uh, the next day, she underwent a right fem to left fem bypass with a graft by one of our general surgeons. Um, was hospitalized for a short period of time and sent back to the nursing home on oral antibiotics. Um, she ended up having a suspicion for uh, sepsis um, and worsening ischemia. She was sent to another facility um, where uh, they did a CTA showing narrowing of the left common deep and superficial femoral arteries. Um, and below the knee, there's a two vessel runoff with anterior tibial artery occlusion. Um, so she comes back into my office uh, two days ago. Um, and then this is what she looks like now. Um, so you can see gangrene is uh, advancing uh, up past the MPJ. Um, that uh, anterior leg wound um, is worsening in appearance. It's enlarging. Um, continued pain. Uh, leg is cold. Um, so at this point, she's had uh, multiple vascular interventions uh, with, with worsening gangrene. Uh, concerns for, um, you know, infection. Um, so at this point, uh, I did recommend a on the amputation versus an above knee amputation uh, on, on her, um, just given her, her real non ambulatory status, unfortunately. Um, so 
you know, you win some and you lose some. Uh, unfortunately, we lost this one. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes uh, concerns of infection uh, trump the leg, and, and we did give it uh, quite a go. So here are your references. Um, and, you know, this is kind of me on that day. Sometimes uh, dealing with PAD can be pretty frustrating. Um, you, you think you're making some good headway, and then you have a setback elsewhere. So, you know, just remember to stay positive, and everything is great. It's just great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Schmidt. That was fantastic. A great overview of PAD, and I definitely appreciate the humor as well. Uh, a quick reminder to everyone, for any questions that you have for Dr. Schmidt or uh, our next presenter, Dr. Vatican Cherry, please enter them in the question box. I know we have one so far, but we'll uh, field these at the end of our talk tonight. So without any more delay, I will now turn it over to Dr. Vatican Cherry, who will speak about management of PAD from the IR perspective. Dr. V? Dr. V, you should be unmuted now. All right, Dr. V, I see your screen, but I do not hear any audio. Are you able to unmute? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, um, really, really appreciate the opportunity to be involved in this collaborative project between podiatry and, and uh, vascular interventional radiology. Um, I think uh, at the resident level, it's a great way to initiate this process. Um, an excellent talk and great overview of what I'm pretty much going to cover as well as kind of the medical management. If we have time, some pedal access pearls and tips, but uh, again, a great overview. And it's really key to understanding the foundation of diseases that we're managing or treating. And uh, our podiatry colleagues are the gurus on this, on this disease, and they have a lot of uh, great orthotics and specialty surgeries and a lot of natural history understanding of diabetic foot and wound care and, and really preserving the limb. So uh, there's a lot to learn from them. And really, as Dr. Schmidt was saying, really, a lot of patients that we do revascularize with foot issues, we should um, refer to podiatry so they can get expert care and make sure they have optimized chance for healing their wound. So um, this is, as you said, so the close of PAD. Um, okay. So no disclosures. Um, there's a lot of faculty advisors on the uh, BIR side that are, are involved in this initiative, including uh, Kumar, Dr. Arslan, who actually started this whole process with the SIR and David Maldov. And, and uh, others have met with the, the heads of podiatry. Um, so we want to give us uh, thanks to Dr. Arslan for starting this process at the SIR last year. And then uh, Kumar Madiseri, also a colleague of us at Rush, Kyle Cooper at University of Michigan, Sri Tamala uh, at University of Miami, uh, one of my colleagues, um, uh, Ken Lamb at Kaiser, are part of the initiative um, here. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from one another um, as far as this goes and hopefully really advance the care of these diabetic patients primarily and really reduce the amputation, amputation and also, again, learn the disease from the radiology standpoint or the interventional radiology resident standpoint and from the podiatry standpoint. I think we can learn a lot about the use of advanced imaging, um, and advanced vascular imaging, but also just, you know, looking at foot and ankle or, you know, anatomy uh, and pathology on MRI, CAT scan, bone scan, et cetera. The utilization of angiography or even using CO2 and various other sequences that are being developed that really can help us to, as adjuncts to PCPO2, toe pressures or toe brachial indices or plethysmography, and the role of endovascular intervention continues to grow in the treatment of the diabetic foot to enhance healing. Uh, again, a lot of uh, surgical options that we may not be aware of that we can really that our podiatry colleagues can really uh, educate us on 
wound care orthotics. Um, again, they do such a great job in a lot of this stuff, and it's really helpful for us to know when to refer these patients to podiatry and how they can really, you know, maximize the care of our patients. So let's just talk about PAD. Peripheral arterial disease is an exceedingly common disease. A very large population of aging, obesity, diabetes is a, a problem even in the youth, and, and um, it's, gonna, it's not getting any better. Smoking is maybe all over uh, globally reduced, but we're still seeing the sequela of smoking from decades ago. And there is growing level one evidence in the endovascular arena for the treatment of peripheral arterial disease. And like I said, it's exceedingly prevalent. So we need to know this disease as we're involved in it, and it includes epidemiology, risk factors, and diagnosis far beyond anatomic imaging, as Dr. Schmidt had discussed, you know, the, the SAM findings, the computer systems history, the kind of rest pain, kind of dangling the feet overnight, sleeping in a chair, those things that we need to be looking for. Laboratory evaluation, whether it be set rates or CRPs, to see if they have an inflammatory component, but physiologic and anatomic uh, understanding. And really, you know, we always want to try a conservative approach if that's effective. But at the same time, if we need to revascularize the limb, we need to be aggressive in trying to improve the flow, improve the healing process for this patient. Again, podiatry care is exceedingly important in this patient population to maximize the chances of uh, this patient uh, ambulating um, effectively. Pharmacologic adjuncts are also in our favor, and we're going to talk about that in endovascular as well as surgical options if they have good vein. Um, surgical options as far as bypass are also an important part of the arsenal in treating these patients. So, when I look at peripheral arterial disease, I look at three essential goals. Number one, keep them alive, right? If the patient has a limb but they're not alive, it doesn't do us any good. So, we need to reduce what they die of, which is cardiovascular events and cerebrovascular events. This is the error of the stroke. We want to prevent it, okay? We want to prevent strokes and heart attacks. So, keep them alive. Number two, prevent amputation. Again, Critical ischemia revascularization is an important component, but uh, more important is a good podiatry care. And again, this is why we need to work with our podiatry colleagues to really enhance the care of our patients globally and improve symptoms of claudication. So these patients that we may be seeing may have leg pain or atypical leg pain, and their quality of life may be diminished and they're bothersome. They may not lose their leg, but they're bothersome, and so we also need to work on that. So my goal is to learn some pharmacology and the role of exercise in this patient population. So let's look at some epidemiology data. This is by Alan Hirsch and published in JAMA in 2001 where he took several thousands of patients to the primary care offices at age 50 to 70 with smoking or diabetes or of age over 70. And in that patient population, the partner trial, there's 29% uh, incidence of uh, abnormal ankle brachial indices or a history of PAD. Now, the primary care physician was unaware or under-treating these patients as far as lipid management, antiplatelets, et cetera. So, again, this is an under-diagnosed and under-treated population. And half of them had only PAD, but the other half had both PAD and coronary uh, vascular disease. So, um, what are the main risk factors for PAD? There's two things that you should be thinking about, okay? Um, smoking and diabetes. Those are the two key things that you should be thinking about, okay? Um, now, let's look at the natural history, but all the other risk factors are important, right? Hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, et cetera, similar to see a coronary artery disease or stroke. Let's look at the natural history. What happens to PAD patients, right? It's a very large population, but what happens? So how do they initially present? A lot of them are asymptomatic with peripheral arterial disease, okay? About 50%. Um, a lot of them may have atypical leg pain. They're older population with arthritis, venous disease, uh, numerous other uh, processes that are impacting them, okay? Neurogenic claudication, so spinal stenosis, you know, radiculopathies, et cetera. Only about 10 to 20% are true classic claudication where they have caffeine, exertional that resolve with the rest, and so on and so forth. So you, when you're talking to patients, you have to recognize that, that it is a mixed bag. Now, critical ischemia, that whole population, a very large population of PD, maybe only 2%, but it's a very important percentage. And why is that? Because they're, they're, it's worse than some cancers. Their mortality is up to quarter. 25% would be dead six months to a year. And their amputation rates are very high. And Dr. Schmidt and the podiatry colleagues are doing an outstanding job of releasing it. And we can help them by improving the circulation to this foot. The revascularization is critical, but it, again, it doesn't do us any good if we don't put them on appropriate medical therapy. So let's look at this atypical leg pain, the asymptomatics and the claudicans. What happens to them in five years? 
So if you look at the five rare outcomes, let's look at the limb. Only a few percentage of those will progress to the point that they become critical in ischemia with breast pain or ulcers or gain or or, or frank gangrene. Okay? Um, majority will be stable and a few will ten or twenty percent may worsen. But let's look at the cardiovascular issues with patients with PED, even asymptomatic PED. A significant mortality related events are heart attacks and strokes. So again, critical in ischemia is a different population, worse than most a lot of cancers. They don't live very long and they have a high rate of amputation. Again, we've done a lot of things to reduce it and we need to continue to do that. They were undertreated, but we need to be aggressive about treating them. Both revascularization, great wound care, and um, uh, medical therapy. Okay? But again, half are alive without an amputation, but then it's a quarter dead and another quarter uh, alive with an amputation. So Dr. Smith uh, proceeded to mention this rather for classification, and I think it's very important that every training basically memorizes this because it has prognostic implications and treatment implications. So rather for zero through four or three is kind of the um, asymptomatic to mild moderate severe clotting. But once you get to critical ischemia, that's rest pain, that's basically unstable angina equivalent of the foot, where, as Dr. Smith said, you're dangling that foot to get flow, so you're gravity dependent. And so that's not a good thing. Um, ischemic ulceration, that's minor tissue loss, and then major tissue loss is five and six. So whether we're four, five, and six, it's unstable angina and then heart attack of the foot, essentially. And that's the way we should approach it. So again, my goal number one is to keep them alive. And that includes educating about dietary quantifications, um, calorie caloric restrictions, uh, and uh, exercise, you know, aggressive exercise regimens, keeping their BMI low and weight to hip indices have to be uh, close to what's feasible. Uh, statins are exceedingly important, not only from the LDL reduction, but the pleiotropic effects of statins we'll talk about a little bit further. Uh, ACE inhibitors and antiplatelets, and as we said, smoking creation is exceedingly important for wound healing and preventing heart attacks and strokes and cancers. And diabetic control, not necessarily for macrovascular, but more for microvascular issues, and neuropathy, nephropathy, and retinopathy, so the eyes, kidneys, and the nerves. Okay, so let's look at statin in the data. 21,000 patients studied in a two-by-two -two fashion in the heart protection study looking at simvastatin and placebo and antioxidants. And what it showed was a marker reduction in the PAD population of requiring a revascularization, whether it be carotid endorectomy or leg bypass, and a remarkable reduction in vascular events, strokes, and MIs, with similar 40 a day. Okay, so that was a landmark trial. Subsequent to that, that was, you know, years and years ago, but subsequent to that, in 2013, this is the HJACC guidelines, based on a lot of trials showcasing the benefit of high-intensity statin therapy. That's the Torvastatin 40s and 80s and the Rizubastatins. Multiple trials, including the Jupiter trial, showcasing the safety and efficacy and benefit of this patient uh, being on statins is the coronary equivalent, and PAD is a coronary equivalent. Aneurysms are a coronary equivalent. They have a high risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events, so they must, if they should be on a statin. They can't tolerate, we should look at other statins, but you want to put them on a high-intensity statin therapy. And I encourage you all to read this uh, guidelines. There's a risk factor uh, calculator that you can put on your smartphone and risk stratify every patient to look at their ACSVD risk. Um, so statins are beyond preventing heart attacks and strokes. They also have other benefits in improving walking time. So this is a randomized trial uh, up to a year out where they looked at 10 milligrams, 80 milligrams of placebo, and 80 milligrams of torvastatin made the primary endpoint of increasing pain-free walking time. So again, it, not, it also improves quality of life, not just preventing heart attacks and strokes and keeping them alive, but it's also functional improvement with statins. So again, this should be some first-line therapy for your patients. What about hypertension? Where do you start, start a lot? So we know that if you look at JNC8 and a lot of the, the data out there, it's really a diuretic is an important initiative. But um, you know, in the African-American population, you could argue calcium channel blockers, but we know the benefits of ACE inhibitors in, in, in cardiac disease, DHF, and producing diabetic nephropathy. Area. But the FOLK trial, which is the Heart Outcomes Prevention Evaluation, is a 4,100 patient randomized trial, looking at RAM, pearl versus placebo, and ACE inhibitor, and it showed a 22% reduction in the PAD population. And this was independent of blood pressure reduction. The average blood pressure reduction in the PAD population is only 3 millimeters of mercury. So again, some pleiotropic effect of the ACE inhibitors. Okay, So the PAD subgroup had a significant reduction in um, 
in, uh, in uh, cardiovascular and supervascular events. Again, this is important to understand. So statin is very important, and an ACE inhibitor looks to be also important as well. Now, I can't emphasize enough. I know it's very frustrating to, that patients feel like, you know, they can't smoke and you feel frustrated because only about 5% of your patients will stop smoking when you tell them. But that's a lot better than 0.1%. So if you don't talk to them about it, only one in a thousand are going to stop on their own. But if you talk to them, 5% will stop. That's so 5 out of 100. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it's actually a 50-fold impact factor, which is not trivial. So it may be kind of depressing. You're like, oh, they're not going to listen. But, you know, the 50-fold impact factor in anything we do in medicine is pretty impressive. There are other adjuncts, including nicotine replacement therapies, gums, patches, um, some uh, Wellbutrin, Varenicline, et cetera, that can also have impact. And there are several trials, like this Varenicline's 12-week randomized trial that showcases its benefit compared to even nicotine replacement therapy and placebo and Zyban. So um, what about antiplatelet? There is a little bit of controversy about antiplatelet therapy in the CAD population, but most people would advocate um, a baby aspirin or 81 milligram of aspirin is probably a good idea um, in this population. Multiple trials will look at this. It's a little bit hit or miss. But there is an interesting trial called the Capri trial. What the Capri trial looked at was Plavix versus aspirin. And so the Plavix versus aspirin, what is suggested in 20,000 randomized patients, when you look at that PED, symptomatic PED population, that's either intermittent claudication or they've had a length amp or revast, there was a significant reduction in supervascular and cardiovascular events. Okay? So in the PED subset, if you look at this, there is a significant reduction in event rate. Okay, so Plavix, based on this trial, may be better. Now, let's, what about dual antiplatelet? I'm not going to uh, go into too much detail, but there was a trial called the Charisma, and the Charisma trial looked at aspirin Plavix combo and suggested that there may be increased risk of bleeding without necessarily a reduction in events compared to single agent. So I don't necessarily put them on dual antiplatelet outside of for the acute intervention that I may do for one to six months, depending on what I do. So you should understand these data points so you can guide and counsel and put the patient in appropriate therapy. Again, statin, clearly of a benefit. These inhibitors show a lot of promise. They some hope trial. And antiplatelets, I tend to you know, put them on uh, Plavix 75 a day. So just things to think about. Dual antiplatelet, maybe for the short term to keep the intervention open, but after that, the benefits may not be uh, great. So always think about this when you're doing this. The bleeding risk is not trivial in some of this. Okay, what about diabetes? Again, our goal is hemoglobin A1C is less than 7%, so you should be checking this um, periodically until you get this to goal directed. Again, we're really trying to prevent retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy. So we want to avoid ESRD patients. If we can reduce that progression, that's a huge impact on patients. Reduce blindness or eye issues and reduce the neuropathy that these patients can develop, which can be painful, debilitating, and lead to uh, mechanical injuries that can lead, lead to amputation. All right, so we talked about this. Statins are critical. They improve walking, you know. Blood pressure, the heart protection study. Blood pressure control. Beta blockers are okay. ACE inhibitors improve function, okay? Maybe, but the data is very questionable. But blood pressure beta blockers are okay, especially in obstructive CAD that can be life-saving. Uh, Antiplatelets, Plavix, arguably is better than aspirin alone. So something to think about. And be careful of dual antiplatelet based is my trial. Smoking, we should all talk to patients about it and give them uh, uh, options on how to stop counseling. Uh, there's um, you know, smoking hotline numbers that many of us have uh, are privy to. And, uh, and diabetes, again, to reduce the retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy. Number two, we want to improve leg pain and function. Okay? So that's exercise, philosophical, and patent. So let's talk about this. Too. So I showed you the, the randomized trial where you improve walking. The Neil Moeller's uh, publication in circulation back in 2002. And again, ADA Vitorva improved pain free walking time, so there is some benefit. Um, this is Gardner's meta analysis. Gardner and McDermott have done a lot of work on, on so supervised exercise, exercise and actually unsupervised exercise in the days of fitness. And even the unsupervised exercise has benefits. So we should strongly encourage this. And I, what I do is I actually write a prescription for my patients on three times, 50 minutes, walk till it's about seven or eight out of 10 pain in the calf or blood rocker thigh, stop, log it, right? They have smartphones, log it, and then resume once it gets to about three out of 10 pain. And I write a prescription, and I bring them back in a, in a month to see how their log is, and two months or three months, okay? So it takes three to six months for a lot of these medications to take effect. 
All right. What about Colostal? Well, it is a good agent, but you, there is an FDA black box label for patients with CHF, and that's based on the Miller known and its impact on mortality of CHF patients. So you need to be aware of that. So look for orthopedia, dyspnea exertion, JVD, purple edema, basal crackle, or just get an echo and see what the EF is. Do they preserve EF or not? And again, sometimes we'll start on with 50 pay BID because sometimes that's a GI side effect. Um, other, um, you know, primary GI side effects that you have to be aware of. So if they can't tolerate full, full dose right off the bat, I'll titrate them 50 and then up. But it is, a, it is a, it, it does help. It does work. And a randomized trial that improves walking distance by 50%. All right. So again, it has various um, uh, ways of working, and it's got some antiviral activity. It has some um, vasodilatory activity. And interestingly enough, in a Japanese trial called Stop IC. It actually reduced instant mucinosis in the peripheral bed, so in a randomized fashion. So this is a, an interesting drug, but realize it does have antiplatelet therapy. So if you have dual antiplatelet and colostal, you just have to be cognizant of that. Um, again, if you look at Pletol or uh, Solosol 50 and 100 compared to placebo, again, it, it has an impact, it improves walking distance. Caveat being that all these drugs, exercise, um, Velocitol, statins, they take time. It's not going to happen in one month. The max effects in the three months, six months, a year. So recognize that patients have to be a little bit patient for the impact to be fully recognized. All right, and this is a comparative benefit. So you see exercise really trumps everything. It's 150% increase compared to baseline. And again, Velocitol is 50%. Uh, this is pentoxyphylin or trentol, as otherwise named, is no different than really the placebo. So really, it's uh, philosophical and exercise is what I tend to prescribe my patients for leg pain and claudication. I get three times, 30 minutes at least, five times a week. I write a, a formal prescription. And this is a, actually the PI was Tim Murphy, who is a, you know, a, an interventional radiologist from Brown University and the Rhode Island Valley Institute, uh, the National Trial, National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute trial. And it's an interesting trial because aortic disease really should, everyone thought, stent first. They randomized these patients to supervised exercise and no supervised exercise, and then they further broke it down to set or no set. And this is an area like very proximal disease population, and the primary employment was peak walking time. What are they seeking? Well, um, and they're pretty compliant with the fossil ball, and exercise compliance was reasonable at 71%. Well, when you look at the primary endpoint, which is really the goal of any trial, it was met with exercise. Exercise even beat stenting. Okay, when you look at the p-value of 0.04, okay, exercise, again, uh, uh, trumped uh, even stenting, okay, so p-value of 0.04. And obviously, exercise stenting better, did better than optimized medical therapy. So an important thing to think about, and I do think there is a significant role for exercise in our patient population. Okay, what about clotting patients at time? Not necessarily much of a difference, meaning walking, not much of a difference, but... When you commit to asking the questionnaire to the patients about what they thought about everything, it seems like the patients like the quick fix. So this is where if you look at the stenting versus, um, you know, um, kind of uh, supervised exercise, this is where actually stenting may have taken the lead in the significant p-value is because patients probably wanted that quick fix and the other ones a lot more effort to get there. So it's just something to be aware of, but the primary endpoint of patient walking time there was an uh, impact with, with exercise. So you should definitely utilize that in your armamentarium. Okay, so what are our conclusions? Um, what is my prescription? Do they have TAD? Check in ABI. If you're still not sure, get an exercise ABI because that's really a definitive way of excluding TAD. Okay? Plan two parts. You got to keep them live. Risk factor modification. Uh, some of them have a double whammy improving leg function. So antiplatelet therapy, 81 of aspirin, or arguably basic for free trial, 75 of plastic. Uh, I tend to use a total of 40 to 80. Okay, I tend to put them on an inhibitor, maybe five of uh, a centerfold. Okay, um, again, it doesn't have to be a dramatic blood pressure reduction. You know? um, beta blockers are certainly okay, and especially in patients with obstructive CAD or or component of CHF, they should be in something of that nature. You have to count them stopping smoking and give them options. And glycemic control, again, to reduce neuropathy, nephropathy, and retinopathy, eyes, kidneys, um, nerves. All right. Part two is I want to make them function better if they're claudicating, right? So I want to keep them alive, but I also want to improve their claudicate, clod their leg, leg pain. So again, philosophical, rule out CHF, um, and then to 
consider putting them on either 50 or I would tend to go 100 PID and tell them to take some time and expect some side effects. Um, and then bring them back shortly. Put them on an exercise regimen, put them on the swap call, bring them back in a month with an exercise log or their Fitbit or their calculator. So identify the clients and uh, CLI patients. Uh, take a proper thorough history and physical. Treat the risk factors, keep them alive. Um, conservative management initially. Um, watch out for the side effects of soloxidol. Follow monthly. If unremitting, consider endovascular fix. And when it comes to critical ischemia, which is what we're really doing with this talk, um, understand that it's exceedingly important that we have good pediatric care and that we need to improve the circulation to optimize healing, right? Because this oxygen nutrition and removing that, that the devitalized tissue is going to be very critical to enabling our podiatric surgeons to get to good wound healing and allow their you know, the great surgeries to, to take. So that's pretty much my main spiel on um, kind of the medical management of peripheral of disease, the knowledge of the natural history, how prevalent it is, and how we all need to take part in educating our primary care physicians about it and working with the podiatric colleagues and really expanding the, the base and reducing amputations in our population, preventing diabetic complications, catching it early, making sure they have proper foot care or orthotics and something we can help or our pediatric colleagues in educating the, the, the masses, the general population, and our primary care docs about. And certainly when we have a patient with PAD, we should be confident them to guide us and, and help our patients to preserve their limbs. Uh, briefly, I'm going to try to maybe talk a couple of cases, but about fetal access. So, you know, disclosures. So this is actually pretty cool. I went to the Mind Vascular Institute uh, to visit uh, some friends and, and uh, so some of them were my former students, they were fellows now, and then my, one of my good friends there, and the, you know, in the group there, an outstanding group, and they have this picture there, which is the original coaxial dilation system, handmade by Charles Daughter, who formed and started interventional radiology, in, and this was developed in 1963. This is a picture of Laura Shaw, who was the original recipient of an interventional procedure in 1964. She had toe gangrene. And everyone said, amputate, amputate, amputate. She absolutely refused. And so at that time, daughter um, was asked, hey, is there anything you do? And he was able to use these Teflon dilators and dilate the SFA. Okay, and this is 1964. And the field, all the field of interventional radiology, as it is known now, started off with this one procedure, essentially. And this is a, 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 a magged up view of this focal high-grade SFA stenosis before and after. And this is Laura Shaw at 82 years of age looking at it. And she lived with both her legs. She ultimately died of congestive heart failure complications, but she lived with both her legs. And so that's something we really patients want, as Dr. Schmidt had said, and we should try to provide them that option and opportunity. And this is 50, you know, three years later, you know, and the advancements are exciting. So pedal access was first described by Dr. Iyer in 1990, and this was actually used to cut down techniques in patients that they failed going up and over or integrate, crossing the uh, closer to the artery. So they cut down on it, they accessed it. And now it's, you know, there's multiple themes of this, um, safari, tammy, whatever you want to call it, but basically you are accessing somewhere around the level of the ankle. This is that first publication of two case reports by Dr. Iyer. So in JVR 2005, UVA group published this uh, safari technique by um, Dr. Spinoza and company, including Alan Matsumoto and Fritz Engel and others that you may be uh, well aware of from the UVA group, and uh, to treat CLI. So the safari, or CAMI, uh, is uh, popularized by Dr. Jihad Mustafa and Dr. Fadi Saab, uh, some outstanding interventional cardiologists who have um, kind of really been promoting the message of really fixing these patients' legs, revascularizing, to allow good podiatry healing. So you know, prep both, So what I do is I prep both groins and the foot that I'm going to be working beside if I'm going to integrate depending on uh, a couple of things. This one is the obesity, uh, but also really if the aortic segment is clear and normal, then I like to go integrate, especially if I'm doing tibial work. Um, if the SFA is involved, then I may go up and over fix that. So it kind of depends on the and that anatomic issues. And so CTA or MRI is helpful or ultrasound. Um, you can start with the uh, micropuncture needle. There's different devices. There's a short one that's pretty exogenic tip and uh, the concomitant wire. Try to use a straight path, minimal calcium, otherwise it'll be hard to penetrate. Use a shallower angle so the wire will kind of float and usually use ultrasound to kind of guide you so you can even watch in the long axis to see the wire track 
Okay, and also sometimes even manipulate through some stenosis using ultrasound guidance. Then usually the inner dilator is what I do, and then kind of shoot a little cheap angiogram to confirm where we're at and what things are looking like. And if you want, at this point, there's a, there's proprietary pedal access kits that you can use that basically are like a micropuncture sheet with a little hub, and then you can inject a, a, a various cocktail similar to a radial cocktail. So the vasodilators like rapid mole nitro. And we tend to try to use high-frequency ultrasound if it's available so that you can really get a good view of that vessel. Um, again, you want to access on the lower end. I know people are accessing higher and higher up, but you always have to be careful of compartment syndrome if you get bleeding or extra app. There's various 0 and 4 and 0 and 8 wires they can utilize um, and various support catheters to give you some drive and body. Now, um, typically we use the kind of exchange length wires and then we'll try to get it, try to stare it from above or through a guide catheter. So we're working from the, uh, the up and over or from the groin side. But uh, once you have a rail, you can pretty much do anything. Okay, so this is an example of where you kind of snare the wire or go through a guide catheter. So the first image is a snare uh, and the second image is a um, guide catheter. Okay, so I usually like to aggressively anticoagulate. I usually do 80 units per kilogram and 1,000 per hour. Goal ACTs are 250 or, or above. Again, a tons of nitro and rapamol are on our, on our table. Um, so what are the advantages? When should you go pedal axis? I think when uh, integrated axes are up and over, you just can't get through, right? Uh, sometimes that'll happen, you work for a while. Um, and I think the one lesions that are at higher risk are the trifurcation lesions. Um, you know, so you have a trifurcation disease, it's always a little bit challenging, you know, this will pop trifurcation, okay? Um, so why does fetal axis work? We think it's because part of the time when you're going down from the femoral artery to the tibials, some of these collaterals are going down going as well, so you'll end up going the collateral and it's hard to stay in the true channel. Whereas you go from below, you don't, you avoid that thing. And also the cap morphology, it may be a little bit thicker and stiffer at the top than the bottom. So those things can kind of help you, okay? Again, flush occlusion, trifurcation disease, you don't really know where your target is sometimes. So going the other way, you kind of, it just kind of pops through magically almost. And this is kind of one of these proprietary kits that you can utilize to get uh, fetal access. But it's basically a micropuncture sheet. And as Dr. Schmidt was saying, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but you need to know your vascular anatomy and angiosome concept, which is uh, popularized by Ian Taylor, the plastic surgeon. And it really guides you, you know, you know where your posterior tibial is. It's not a, you need to know where the medial and plantar plantar arteries are feeding. You need to know where your calcaneal branches are. Is it a heel ulcer? Is it, is it a toe ulcer? Is it a you know, proximal right? Is it a great toe? Is it a digit? Is it a plantar aspect? Where is the ulcer so you can optimize the flow to that territory. Now, sometimes you can go by a contralateral, you know, a P, the AT through the perforator into the PT territory, but if you can get strain light flowing, you should consider that. And again, this is some more um, kind of angiosome concepts and pedal loops and arches that you should be aware of. And uh, this color diagrams of the different uh, kind of angiosome territories. So again, realize where you need to open the flow based on where the wound is to maximize your healing potential. And so again, this is kind of the anatomy um, uh, that you need to know. So I, what I usually tell trainees is understand the posterior tibia goes to the medial lateral plantar artery, dorsalis pedis into lateral tarsal, and a I mean the anterior tibia and dorsalis uh, into a dorsalis pedis and lateral tarsal artery. The popliteal artery at the top here uh, on the left side of the screen, um, you can see here we'll trifurcate usually to anterior tibial across the syndesmosis, and then become the TP trunk. So it's truly a bifurcation. Right, most of the time. And then the perineal is almost a straight line, vessel down, the posterior tibial goes posteriorly and around the malleolus. Okay, so you should understand that. And then the medial plantar is a little more cranial on the lateral foot and the lateral plantar is here. And the DP and usually a little lateral, uh, lateral tarsal will come out more proximal. And then the perineal can have an anterior perforator and posterior communicating branch that can supply the AT or PT territory. So just recognize that. So sometimes the perineal is a dominant supply to the foot or the only runoff. So know all these when you're getting into the equation. And this is what the uh, PT or AT will look like. It usually looks like a Mickey Mouse. They'll have a compressible, two compressible veins usually, and in the middle it'll be a uh, semi-compressible artery. And it depends on how much flow there is. It may be completely flat, 
it may have some toxicity or be, be hard to compress. So if there's no flow, that's often because there's significant inclusion. So you just have to understand those concepts, you know, of how compressible it is. If it's calcified, it's not going to compress well either, right? So it's rigid. So all these concepts are going to be important. And so you stick it, you get blood flow, you watch under ultrasound, you advance the wire, and you just kind of keep on working to get through the blocks and then ultimately dilate. Now, this is actually a patient that um, you look at the heel right here. Just watch this. this we took out the, uh, we, we went up, we snared from above, and we we're going to work from below. We removed the distal axis, and you see it's just kind of slowly bleeding, but it really just a little ooze. But that's why I only need really, this is probably overkill. I use just five minutes of manual pressure uh, with a finger on the a, a DP or PT and you're done. But some people are doing this in the lab. So some of my friends, this is certain, um, my friends are doing this in the outpatient lab, just putting a TR band and getting up. But I don't know if you really need to. My experience is a little hand pressure. Even fully hyperized on an antiplatelet is, is more than adequate. So this is a 93-year-old lady with a left leg ischemic wound, non-palpable popliteal pulse, monophasic signal in the, the foot. Area of the runoff looks pretty good. Proximal SFA some, uh, is okay. There's moderate disease in the mild and moderate in the mid SFA. Profunda has uh, got some disease distally here. Okay, so SFA has some mild and moderate disease here. Long segment occlusion of the SFA reconstituted by profunda collaterals of the popliteal. And the pop is occluded as well. And you can see the, the TP trunk is diseased and so is the perineal PT and the extensive disease of the perineal. So then we um, work pretty hard, work subintimal. We actually tried it out back to get back in. This is becoming more and more of a, you know, a mess, just a lot of extra ab. So then we just, um, instead of wasting time, we went and stuck the foot, went up, and um, we were able to balloon the SFA, pop the teal, down to the foot. Now you see good pedal uh, plantar loop. Uh, the, the perineal looks pretty good, and the DP is reconstituted by the perforator. So again, uh, doing subintimal techniques, as well as pedal access, you can really uh, take a, a significant multi-level disease and, and revascularize the patient. She ultimately had a, a good wound healing. Even at an elderly age, you can do it local and sedation, so that's a benefit of this uh, intervention. A uh, 60-year-old lady who, a patient of mine, had hypertension hyperlipidemia, had actually stenting of a subclavian and a coronary bypass as well. Um, no non-smoker, no diabetes, no hypertension, really no risk factors. Uh, she had bilateral leg pain, breast pain, pretty significant, and a left heel ulcer that was non-healing and spontaneous ulcer is Uh Again, she does not have any risk factors for coronary disease, okay, or, or PAD. Uh, you can see her area leg segment's pretty good, but then you look at her SFA on the right, long segment SFA occlusion, uh, severe disease, strainy BD, and her tibial trifurcation was out. And you can see the PT there kind of supplying the foot. So um, this, this was actually a vasculitity. So, um, but now she's got spontaneous ulcers. She's at high risk of limb loss. She's on prednisone. So went ahead and revast her. Um, did a similar thing when pedal uh, went up uh, as I couldn't get through. And here's the snare wire, snare wire uh, and catheter, snare the wire through, okay? And then just did serial balloon dilatation. And uh, she actually healed her wounds and her rest pain resolved. So um, so these are key toolboxes that we didn't have maybe 30 years ago. Daughters certainly didn't have it. Uh, we didn't have the toys or tools or the low profile balloons or the wires and the, you know, and the knowledge that we have now. So this is another tool in the endovascular toolbox that enables us to treat these patients. But again, this is great, but it's really important to Put them on appropriate therapy. Know your conservative measures, including exercise. Um, therapy statins are critical. ACE inhibitors should be strongly considered, and antiplatelets such as Plavix or, or aspirin. Um, and Zolostol is a good adjunct uh, for claudicans. That's pretty much my key things, and I really appreciate uh, um, work you know, Dr. Schmidt uh, giving us this initial lecture. And again, I'm, I'm really excited about this slew of what, um, collaborative processes and who knows what can come from this relationship and I hope it not only starts at the you know at the attending level there's already some establishment with the, uh, you know Dr. Miller uh, he texted me and a slew of uh, SIR leadership has been involved in work with podiatry uh, Arsenal and I, I can't thank him enough for getting this initiative going but I really want to see our residents learn more about these diseases and I think as our residents and even our medical students 
learn about these diseases, they can educate primary care physicians, their other students and patients as well, you know, and other healthcare providers about this and work with the podiatry colleagues to really uh, kind of stamp out amputation, reduce diabetic complications by preventing wounds. Uh, again, thank you everyone for um, uh, listening in and I think this is a highly successful event with uh, the collaboration between these two groups. Thank you, David, for really coordinating this, and Danielle for really coordinating this event. Thank you so much, Dr. V, and uh, Dr. Schmidt as well. Uh, that was that was terrific, and uh, certainly from the resident perspective, uh, very motivated to continue this collaboration and uh, work towards um, growing this relationship uh, at that level as well. Uh, so before we close tonight, I'll address any questions to Dr. V and Dr. Schmidt. Uh, this one came in during Dr. Schmidt's presentation, so I will we'll start with him. And Dr. V, feel free to chime in after as well. Uh, this question is from Dia, and it is: It seems the vascular surgeons in my area don't act very quickly regarding forefoot toe ischemia, and I've had a few patients go on to amputation when I felt it if vascular would have been more prudent sooner, this could have been avoided. Question is, when when do you recommend that we go ahead and order the MRA or angiogram when we know there is a serious problem, but it's not getting addressed by vascular? And when do you decide whether to refer to a vascular surgeon versus an interventional radiologist for revascularization? Well, so I, I would say that um, two things. One is, if you have forecrit ischemia and you have documentation with your toe pressures, toe brachial indices, TCPO2, uh, lack of pulses, whatever it may be, um, and you have a high suspicion there's inadequate circulation, then you know you do due diligence to get advanced imaging. If they have ESRD, perhaps CTA, but the problem is that the calcified vessels and the tibial circulation will make it very difficult to assess that area. MRA is great, but the problem is in the GFR less than 30, it's relatively contraindicated. There are some techniques to do with that, but it's something to consider. Uh, in my opinion, I think most people, you know, I mean, whoever your vascular specialist is, the IR, vascular surgeon, cardiology, whoever does it well, you should, uh, you know, get it to them. Um, but if there's no reason why you can't get a second opinion from another doc. If your suspicion is high and your concerns are great, you guys are experts in this disease, I think it's imperative to get a second opinion, whether it be another vascular surgeon, another IR, one IR, you know, you should just, you know, um, you know get a second opinion for your patient to see. Yeah, just kind of echoing what Dr. V said, you know, if you have documented signs of ischemia or a non-healing wound um, <clears throat> and you have objective uh, tests like ABIs, uh, TCPO2, CBIs um, that kind of back up those claims, um, you know, if, if vascular surgery, if, you're, if your revascularization specialist isn't uh, serious about it, absolutely get a second opinion. Um, I have a very close relationship with my interventional radiologist. Um, uh, we have each other's cell phones, and when I call them up and I say, I really need you to look at this person, I have a concern, um, they're, they're there to see him that day or the next day, and vice versa. We've kind of built a relationship between the two of us where if somebody needs to get in and see, get seen, it bypasses our nursing staff, it goes right to us, and we make that decision. Um, so I think having a good relationship with your vascular service, whether it's uh, vascular surgery or interventional radiology, um, is really important. Um, but ultimately, your responsibility is to the patient, not to the other provider. So if you feel that their, um, their issues are not being addressed appropriately, um, you need to go around that other service and find another way to get some treatment through a, a second opinion. And hopefully this, uh, again, this, you know, this relationship with this chain amongst the residents and the, and the, uh, the, the podiatry residents and students and the the IR residents and students will also enable you to develop relationships now so that you can talk clearly and educate one another about you know the, your concerns or what you can do and what you know what you need to do. And so I think with that with with us understanding more of what you can offer, what you can do and what you need, and vice versa, I think it'll impact patient care. So we hope that we can globally reduce it does take a village as Dr. Schmidt said to take care of these patients, not just podiatrists, not just not surgeries, not just IR. Also, infectious disease, it's, it's home health, wound care, a slew of other things, a lot of other people involved in this. 
to you know optimize the patient's care, physical therapy, et cetera. So we need to utilize all these resources to again take care of the patient. And I agree with Dr. Schmidt, it's very important to involve the family in this. Okay. So we did a rebass yesterday on a patient who's, you know, her nephew was there, his uh, uh, brother was there, and his daughter was there, and it's really important because they're all worried about it. You know, losing a limb is a, not a trivial matter. Laura Shaw, in 1963, uh, 1964, refused an amputation. She'd rather die. Okay, and that's how the field of retro radiology began. So re realize how important that is, and that our, the birth of the specialty, the birth is, is based on that. Absolutely. Thank you uh, both. Uh, any last questions before we close this evening? Well, I just would like to uh, once again thank our presenters, Dr. Schmidt and Dr. Vatican Cherry. Uh, we have somebody's hand raised. Uh, would you mind typing this into the question box? Um, actually, Amir, I can unmute you now if you'd like to speak. Hello? Hey, yes, we can hear you. Hi, um, I was just wondering in terms of, uh, um, you know, building the relationship and the like, you know, we, we have this initiative and that's um, great, but uh, and when we go into uh, practice ourselves, um, do you guys have any tips on how to build that relationship then uh, during practice? You know, I, I think if you have a passion for, you know, Peripheral heart disease or wound, you know, wound care and limb salvage, uh, it'll declare itself, you know, and then you meet with them and showcase your passion that you, you know, it's beyond just plumbing, but like you have a true passion for this disease population, taking care of these patients, uh, it'll come out. And I think the, our podiatry colleagues will, you know, respect us for showcasing that, you know, and I think, you know, there's nothing you can do if you truly believe in taking care of the population, you'll find a way to make it happen. And I think, uh, again, uh, the start is now, right? The start is at the training level to develop these relationships. And again, it goes far beyond just when salvage. I think what we can do with podiatry and radiology and IR work together is learn more about, hey, what's the role of advanced imaging in, in this population, whether it be beyond just uh, maybe with foot and ankle surgeries of, you know, that they may be doing and, and learning those pathologies and whatnot. Um, it can probably expand our role in other areas and, and just deepen our understanding of even musculoskeletal conditions in the foot that we may not have. So start establishing it then and again, maintain your passion for the disease. Thank you. And I, I, I agree with what Dr. V said and, and you have this commonality and it's your patient. Um, and if you, I, and I don't know what your specialty is, but if you go to either the interventional radiologist or the podiatrist, and you let them know um, that you're passionate about saving this patient's leg, that you understand what you're doing, and you understand what they're doing. You build a commonality. Uh, for me, as a, as a podiatrist, my interventional radiologist is um, extremely well uh, versed in pedal anatomy. Um, to me, that says that he is interested um, in, in treating those patients that have non-healing wounds and, and, and have issues with the lower extremity. So, you know, just, just through talking to him, I understand his level of knowledge. That makes me feel infinitely more comfortable sending my patients to him knowing that they are getting uh, fantastic care. And that's vice versa. When I, when I treat a patient, I give them updates as to how they're doing. I talk about what I'm doing with them um, and how we can collaborate. And to him, he knows that I know my stuff. And it's, it's kind of a funny um, side note. Uh, not too long after I started working at my hospital, uh, they hired a new general surgeon. Um, and I won't tell you who, what, what major city he's the mayor of, but he's the mayor of a major city nearby. Um, so he came in with a lot of, uh, um, uh, he came in with a lot of, uh, he was well known. So he came in and he said that he was the limb salvage expert or that was one of his interests. Well, funny thing is we had a, um, uh, internal medicine doctor that referred an ischemic toe over to him and he did an amputation on that toe and uh, I came into the physician's lounge and my interventional radiologist who is, who is very well known in the group uh, said hey did you hear what happened and I said no and he told me a story about how the uh, general surgeon took off the toe and he goes don't worry it won't happen again and I said well what do you mean and he goes well I told him in our hospital 
nobody touches a foot unless you're a podiatrist. And to me, that was that was huge. You know, I had built this uh, really good relationship with them. And he told off the mayor of a major city, one of the general surgeons, he said, don't touch a foot ever again in, in our hospital. And uh, so he, he, he definitely uh, drew the line um, for me in that instance. And that was kind of a, a cool little uh, thing that he did. But, you know, just establishing that relationship uh, through your patients, uh, just very important. Wow. Thank you. Great, thank you guys once again. And uh, to answer uh, DJ's question, yes, this webinar will be uploaded. It is being recorded and will be uploaded within the next couple of days to the RFS IR Education YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to check it out there, and I will, of course, pass it along to our podiatry colleagues as well. Uh, one more question from John Doe. Uh, in light of the partner study, should we be encouraging screening ABI in diabetic patients in the clinic even without claudication? So uh, I'll just give you my uh, two cents. So there's a, it's been a lot of uh, discussion and controversy about this. Um, uh, and I'm not sure about the most recent things, but we were really pushing hard as a vascular community with the vascular medicine, cardiology, vascular surgery, interventional radiology, to kind of push this initiative of ABIs. But there's debates whether it's cost effective, what does it really mean, do they really believe in secondary prevention? There's a lot of unanswered questions unanswered. But I would say yes, but that's my biased uh, approach, so I'd be you know, really curious to see what uh, Dr. Schmidt does. Um, but I think it's not unreasonable, you know, I think a pulse exam, uh, it just gives me understanding global atherosclerotic disease. So I personally think it's important, uh, just like the aortic atherosclerosis on a kind of CT has implications and they do respond to statin therapy and we show this in population based studies. I do think that ABI um, should as well, but again, maybe slightly biased, there's data both ways, so it's hard to know. Screening studies are always challenging. Um, even if they release the event, they can have other sequela, you know, so I have to always, you know, understand that, and there's a cost of screening. Um, and so, you know, we have to look at a societal population-based thing, whether it be mammography, colorectal cancer screening, uh, lung cancer screening, any of the screenings, triple A screening, um, there needs to be good data, and there needs to be a cost implication when we're doing things at a societal level, or a national, or international level. But my bias is yes. Um, I personally don't uh, order ABIs in all my diabetics right off the bat. Um, I'm not against screening. I just don't personally order ABIs on, on all my diabetics. But I will tell you that I have a, a very low threshold for ordering an ABI. Um, I look at my patients. I look at, you know, we talked about history of present illness, physical exam. Um, if they have any uh, signs and symptoms of PAD, even if it's pretty minor, and they are diabetic, then yes, I will order an ABI on them. Great. All right. Well, I appreciate all the discussion, and uh, I think we'll use that as a closing point for this evening. Uh, I think this was a tremendous uh, presentation, and want to thank Dr. Vatikachari and Dr. Schmidt again for uh, such wonderful talk. And I hope this is the start of a growing relationship. And for our audience, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Uh, look out for in the near future hopefully another webinar where we can all uh, learn from each other once again and uh, thank you to Diane for her help with coordinating this effort. Uh, with that we'll close for the evening and I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you Dave. Thank you Diane. Thanks so much David. Thanks everyone. Yeah thank you. Thanks Dr. Smith. Thank you.